All righty. Good evening, everybody from across Canada and internationally. I'm going to wait a couple seconds as I see everyone is slowly joining in here into the webinar. Uh, as many of you know, it's my uh, kind of favorite tradition to kind of break the ice here. So I'll get you to use that webinar chat feature in your Zoom toolbar to type in where you're tuning in from, uh, what province or territory or country, even if you're outside of Canada. Let us know by using your Zoom toolbar there. And uh, while you do that, I'll quickly introduce myself. My name's Troy, and I'm the Director of Operations for Nurses Specialized in Wound Ostomy and Continence Canada. Really excited to see you again. And today we have a fantastic educational webinar in partnership with Integral Life Sciences. And today's uh, presenter is Dr. Jeffrey Jensen, and I'll introduce him in just a second. Before we get to that, I wanna remind everybody that uh, this webinar is being recorded. So you and your colleagues will be able to uh, access this as a recording on our website after the fact. Usually we get it up there within 24 to 48 hours, um, but we'll let you know once it's available. Uh, we are going to be having a Q&A portion at the end of the webinar, so make sure you use that Q&A tool uh, in your Zoom toolbar to ask your questions. We'll monitor the chat as well, but if you can get them into the Q&A box, it'll make it easier for us to filter through those and make sure we can get uh, an answer to each of them. Uh, and lastly, we will be offering certificates of attendance for all of our attendees today. Uh, just note that we're still working on our, our uh, post-national conference certificates of attendance as well. So they'll be in the queue and we'll make sure to get those to you uh, before the end of the week as well. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce our session today, which is on offloading diabetic foot ulcers, the clinical benefits of early intervention using a total contact cast system. And our presenter today is Dr. Jeffrey Jensen. And uh, Dr. Jensen is currently the Dean of the Arizona School of uh, Podiatric Medicine at Midwestern University in Glendale. He previously served as the Dean at the Barry University School of Podiatric Medicine from 2010 to 2014. And as Dean, he founded the Paul and Margaret Brand Research Center in 2011. From 1994 to 2010, Dr. Jensen was the Clinical Director of the Diabetic Foot and Wound Center in Denver, Colorado, and served as the Externship and Research Director at the North Colorado Podiatric uh, surgical residency from 2001 to 2010. He was an assistant clinical professor at the University of Colorado Health Science Center, uh, also from uh, 1995 to 2010. And as an active researcher throughout his career, Dr. Jensen has generated over $5 million in research grants from the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Defense, and state organizations. This research has resulted in over 10, or sorry, in 10 patents for products addressing diabetic foot wounds, fractures, and antimicrobials. His most recent research involves a defense uh, advanced research product, sorry, defense advanced research project, product, projects agency or DARPA grant assessing uh, gaseous nitric uh, oxide under pressure as an antimicrobial for multi-drug resistant organisms. And in 2000, Dr. Jensen founded a medical device company called Metaficiency that created the TCC-EZ a total contact casting system used to offload and assist in healing diabetic foot ulcers. So without further ado, I'm really happy to pass over the microphone and the slides to Dr. Jensen. Thanks, Dr. Jensen. Thank you, Troy, Troy and thank you for the introduction. I appreciate it. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm so happy to be with you today. Um, Canada is, is near to my heart. In fact, I was sharing with Troy that I'm going to go up into Ontario and go walleye fishing for a week, leaving on Saturday. So um, even though I'm in sunny Arizona right now, I'm looking forward to getting some cooler weather. So that's great. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is first line therapies that work for diabetic foot ulcers, for healing them in a timely fashion and really avoiding the complications we see once they get infected. So that you'll notice that the title of my slide is ECC Easy for Pressure Relief. We usually call it offloading but there's been more and more research done with consensus documents. So we're coining the term VIPs for vascular infection and pressure relief as being probably the most researched areas of the diabetic foot. So indeed, I, I did invent the TCC EZ. I sold the company in 2012. Uh, the EZ product actually hit the market in 2008 after multiple reiterations or iterations, if you will, trying to find a device that really worked well to protect the neuropathic foot while patients ambulate. So I wanted to introduce you to the first slide. Leaders do the right thing and managers do things right. And one of the keys is to know when we are leading and know when we are managing, because all of our jobs, whether we're in the clinic or we're administration, uh, we're constantly balancing this act. When are we acting as leaders to do the right thing? And when are we acting as managers in terms of doing things right? So 
I'm going to say that when you're treating the diabetic foot, you need a quarterback, right? And the quarterback is usually the leader, the person who's calling the shots. And you'll see as I give this talk, I, I really emphasize offloading or pressure relief as just one of the factors that are required to get optimal outcomes. So we'll talk about that as we go through the talk today. So what you see here are a, a conglomeration of, of consensus documents highlighting the three areas we just discussed, vascular concerns, infection control, and offloading or pressure relief. Collectively, these consensus documents give us practice guidelines. And these are the three areas that are the most researched and probably the most critical in terms of getting healing. And here they are in terms of the VIPs. Uh, it's so important. And we've made such tremendous advances in vascular management and reconstruction to get perfusion into the foot. Uh, we've made great advances in infection management with IV antibiotics, oral antibiotics, we're even treating osteomyelitis with antibiotics now. So we've made tremendous strides in that regard. When it comes to pressure relief or offloading, total contact casting has been a gold standard for decades, but it has been significantly underutilized. I'm very happy to share with you that, when, and I'll show you in some a study in a little bit, that the TCC-EZ offloads patients just as well as a traditional total contact cast, and it's much easier to apply. So once TCC-EZ was released in 20, 2008, um, there have been over 2.5 million casts applied, which is really a lot when you consider that back just 20 years ago, there were less than 20,000 casts being billed to our national Medicare service a year in the United States. So really TCC, total contact cast EZ, has become a mainstay for treatment and part of the essential algorithms and protocols uh, that are used throughout the country and around the world for offloading. So, of course, the VIPs, vascular concerns, infection management, and pressure relief aren't the only things we address. Wound debridement's essential, blood sugar controls are essential, patient education and compliance. Uh, I've often told my, my residents and my students that the patients don't show up at your office and leave their foot there and pick it up when it's healed. They need to understand the entire process of what it takes to get good outcomes. So we cannot gloss over patient education or compliance. And of course, the wound environment is absolutely crucial. And when we talk about wound environment, we're usually talking about how any kind of product, whether it's bioengineered tissues or growth factors or cellular scaffolding materials, their role is to enhance the proliferative phase of wound healing. So after we debride the wound, the patient goes through a two to five day period of the inflammatory phase of wound healing. And then once they enter the proliferative phase of wound healing, advanced products either enhance the proliferative phase or shorten the proliferative phase or both. So it really is important what we put on the wound also. So as you all know, there are so many different ways that the patient with a diabetic foot with neuropathy with or without vascular compromise can, can present to the clinic, which makes it all the more important that we have a very method, um, uh, process, if you will, in a prioritized process, if you will, of working these patients up. And the top line of priority is infection and vascular concerns. Once we address those two things, then we can take the patient, transition them into an outpatient setting. And many have granted, many of our patients will show up with no infection and great blood supply. If that's the case the setting where we can debride the wounds, offload them, and get them with the appropriate dressings on. And then, like I mentioned before, the educational component is huge. So when I show you pictures like this of all these different ways patients can present, it stands to reason that we need to have a very systematic process of working those patients up. So I, I like to give my disclaimer here, but Troy kind of did it for me already. Um, so I did invent the TCCEZ. Um, I hold multiple patents on it. I sold my company to Derma Sciences. You, you may remember Derma Sciences in 2012, and Derma Sciences was acquired by Integra in 2017. Um, Integra has really enabled the TCCEZ to be spread throughout the entire country in a very efficient manner because of their sales network and their connections and their contracts. So they still keep me around to give lectures like this once in a while, and I'm very appreciative of that. So just a little history about me. Um, as Troy said, I, I was uh, the medical director for the Diabetic Foot and Wound Center in Denver, Colorado for 17 years. During that time, we averaged between 800 and 1,200 total contact casts a year. 
Um, and I've trained over 8,000 doctors and, and nurses and physical therapists and nurse practitioners uh, in, in how, to, how to utilize total contact casting as a primary line of treatment. So when we say appropriate offloading or pressure relief can be the difference between the wound in the center, right? An innocuous, non-infected, well-vascularized diabetic foot ulcer. If we don't offload it, it becomes a race to whether the patient heals or the patient gets infected. So truly, once this patient's worked up, offloading these patients, uh, if you offload them with a total contact cast, you let them ambulate while they heal, you can expect about 90% of the patients to heal in three to five weeks. And we'll talk more about uh, studies and, and meta-analyses in a little bit. The alternative is if the patient, if this wound doesn't heal and it's open for a long period of time and they undergo serial debridements because there's ground pressures and horizontal pressures creating more and more callus, sooner or later that patient's going to get infected and you're gonna see them end up in the hospital with an infection and then they will, actually I'll show you a stat in a few minutes, of the patients that get infected, 20% 20 20 of them actually go on to an amputation. So we want to avoid that at all costs. So when we talk about first-line therapies, we're talking about modalities that allow patients to heal as quickly as possible to avoid those complications. I just I wanted to share a more recent article. This is a fun article, uh, which was uh, in Open Diabetes, a British, a British journal, and it was published about a year ago. And I thought it was interesting because the authors were between Jordan in the Middle East and Australia. So that's a long distance. But I thought it was interesting to, to share with you factors associated with adherence when patients wear removable cast walkers. Because as you know, they don't have feeling. So they're apt to not take this horrendous situation quite as seriously as they should sometimes. So I just I put a few things in red that I wanted you to see. Some of them are, are kind of funny. So they looked at 57 participants wearing removable walking casts. And if you were to look at the adherence level, only 33.6% of the time were they wearing their boot, even though they claim to wear it all the time. I think in the middle there in the results, the funniest thing was the lowest adherence levels, the number one predictor was being a male. I don't, I don't know what that says for us guys, but that's not a good sign. The second factor was the longer they had diabetes, the third factor was that they didn't have peripheral vascular disease. So they were very often very active. They were walking around and doing things. They did not want to be slowed down by their boot. And then the last thing that they noted was that they didn't like heaviness. They did not like the weight of removable cam walkers. So this really, the study goes to show you that we need to take the compliance component or adherence component out of the patient's hands so that we can share with them the, the optimal ways to treat patients and their wounds so that they heal quickly and they can get back to uh, activities of daily life. So I think the, the study was kind of fun and I just, I thought it was kind of funny also to share with it with you. So you probably have all seen this study. It's already almost, it'll be five years old this November. It was in diabetes care, but we've noticed in the literature um, and through all the data collection that after years of decline, the rate of amputations increased by 50% between 2009 and 2015, which is really, it's fascinating, right? Because we have all these advanced products. There's probably a never, there's never been a better time to have a diabetic foot ulcer if you're a patient. In the United States, we've got over 2000 wound care centers. But what I want you to do is I want you to look at those dates, 2009 to 2015, because I'm gonna show you another study here in a couple of minutes that may very well correlate uh, with reasons why we're seeing increases in amputation rates. And I also should note, this study had increases in minor amputations, meaning those of the foot, digits, metatarsals, and major amputations defined as a below the knee amputation or above. So, so both of those categories, and that makes sense, right? Um, there was some speculation early on when this article first came out that we we're doing fewer below the knee amputations and more digits and rays. But as, as it turns out, um, both, both of those categories had an increase in amputation rates. So here's, here's kind of some of the articles I wanted to share with you. Um, and I, and I, they're spread out about 15 years apart. But if you go back to the Pecoraro's data in 1990, and this is when I was in podiatry school, 84% of all amputations are preceded by a diabetic foot ulcer. Makes sense. Um, it really highlights the need for first-line therapy so that we can get that wound healed before it gets infected and leads to an amputation. 
are self-evident, right? If you fast forward from that study 15 years, Larry Lavery and David Armstrong published a study in diabetes care that showed 50% of all diabetic foot ulcers get infected, half. Of those that get infected, 20% receive an amputation. So again, what this really does is it highlights the need to have effective first-line therapies so we heal the patients instead of get them getting infected. And if we do that, we significantly drop the amputation rates. So I want to show you this study. This Look at the dates on this study, 2008 to 2015. Remember the amputation rates in the other study from diabetes care, the dates were between 2009 and 2015. So there's significant overlap. This is tremendous data. This was gathered by IntelliCure and Dr. Caroline Fife out of Texas, where they looked at all the patients that came into 96 clinics in 23 states over a five-year period. Um, and it's a lot on this slide, but I want to put your attention over to the right-hand column on the where they're talking about numbers. Look at the third number down, total clinic visits. So there were almost a quarter million clinic visits, right, during this five-year period. The average age was 63.9 age. Uh, years of age. So when I show you these stats about you know the, the gap between what we know from an evidence perspective and what really happens in the real world, I think it's rather shocking. So mind you, 21, 221,000 visits. How many of those visits do you think had offloading or pressure relief documented in the chart? And if we were all together in the same room, we'd talk about this more, but I will share with you that the answer is 2%. Only 2% of a quarter million diabetic foot ulcer visits to specialty care clinics had offloading or pressure relief even mentioned in the chart. So if our VIPs, our vascular infection and pressure relief, can you imagine if we only assessed vascular status 2% of the time or infection control 2% of the time? That's essentially what was happening in all of these clinics around the country. They were not offloading feet. Is it any wonder we had amputations? So in fact, of those almost quarter million visits, less than 5,000 had offloading. And a third of them were offloading with post-op shoes. And post-op shoes have never had an article in the history of diabetic foot care showing post-op shoes were optimal for healing. So really, this is a sobering study. Um, and it really, it really got a lot of people's attention here in the, in the United States, especially folks like Heologix that are in charge of 850 clinics. Um, they were realizing that offloading and pressure or slash pressure relief certainly is a component that makes the difference between healing and non-healing. So here, here's some good news. The good news is the entire world has the same problem. It doesn't matter if you're in Brazil or England, Ireland, throughout Europe, Japan, Australia, or in, in, in the United States and Canada. I've traveled the entire world teaching the top doctors in the world how to uh, not only treat diabetic patients, but assess them appropriately. And the biggest challenge by far is the ability to offload these patients. So we get right back to that, not only clinician education, but patient education component. So there've been multiple, as I showed you before, uh, consensus documents. And these are a couple of the best lines from the consensus documents. From uh, the top one is from Ostomy and Wound Care, uh, 2010, from a practical standpoint, a more, a more widespread adoption of effective offloading modalities would make the most improvement in diabetic foot ulcer healing. Effective offloading modalities is defined as something below the knee that shortens stride length and is irremovable. So like a, a irremovable cast, like a total contact cast. Um, a second study, and I was, I was on this group in 2014, uh, the, the determination at the end of the study was total contact casting is the preferred method for offloading diabetic plantar foot ulcers, and it consistently demonstrates the best outcomes and is cost effective. So um, I think that's a, that's a mouthful, but it really says a lot when you consider that every article that was ever written on offloading at the time was included in this consensus document. So let's talk about efficacy. Um, if you look at all the studies that have been done on total contact casting with diabetic foot ulcers, the healing rate's about 90% in five to eight weeks. And if you were to do a meta-analysis where you combined all the data, it's 88% of the wounds heal in an average of 43 days. So if you're like me, you say to yourself, okay, 88% of the wounds heal in 43 days, that's fabulous. Um, 
who are the other 12%, right? And I can tell you anecdotally, because we're doing some research on this right now, that it appears that lateral border wounds, fifth metatarsal head wounds, base of the fifth metatarsal wounds are the hardest to offload, even if you're in a total contact cast. So the casts need a little bit of modification to, to fill in that medial aspect to redistribute pressure throughout the foot to enable them to heal also. But nonetheless, I mean, 90% in five to eight weeks, you don't see results like this, especially uh, when you're looking at advanced wound products that are, are controlled. The research studies are blinded and controlled by the FDA. You just don't see outcomes like this. Usually you see less than 50% of the patients heal that got the, the drug itself or the skin substitute itself and about 30 to 35% heal that are in the placebo group. So let's talk about total contact cast for a couple minutes. Um, the TCC-EZ, when I designed it, I designed it to work as well as a traditional total contact cast. I wanted it to have all the components that a traditional cast had, but I wanted it easy for the doctors to apply. I knew that if the doctors would apply it and the nurses would apply it and the physical therapists would apply it, that the patients would go with it because it works. And then the clinicians would be confident that advocating for total contact casting would be a great idea. So that's great. So let's let's look at some uh, a video here. This is the essence of a cast. Shortens the stride length, eliminates the propulsive phase of gait, which, which puts pressure on the ball of the foot. And if you do that, you'd minimize pressures on the bottom of the foot. You increase the pressures into the cone of the leg and ultimately, you decrease shearing forces. So if you decrease ground pressures, you can reduce shearing forces. It's very difficult to measure shearing forces. But I can tell you that if we eliminate shearing forces, we truly eliminate the callus buildup and allow that leading edge of epithelial tissue to migrate from the periphery. So I wanted to share a study with you that was done in Texas, and it was published during covid um, and this is just a funny picture I had from years ago when I had a pa one patient was in a traditional cast and another and her other leg was in an easy cast uh, that was due to the Charcot deformity that she had on the right leg. So um, as I mentioned, we, I designed these to be comparable in terms of, of pressure relief. Uh, but when we look at this study, which was literally this, this study was released right at the beginning of COVID. Uh, at the end of March, 2020. And if you look at some of the names on this study, you'll see Dr. Larry Lavery, you'll see Dr. Dane Wukic, uh, leaders in, in the wound care space in the entire world. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to assess what they called for the study purposes, prefabricated total contact caskets. Uh, guess which one they're talking about? They're talking about the tcc -EZ. So I'll simplify this study for you. The abstract was kind of nice because they acknowledged that total contact casting is the gold standard. And that if you'll notice the second paragraph on the left, prefabricated kits, such as the TCCEZ, offered a user-friendly casting process for healthcare providers. So everything that I designed the cast for, they were assessing, which I thought was good. So they did, they did the studies on a treadmill with the patients ambulating and they did pressure mapping. And they looked at, and the significant data was in peak pressures and cast weight. I thought that was interesting because peak pressures are very important. Uh, the entire pressure distribution is important. But remember in the study we showed um, from the British Medical Journal where they talked about the weight of the cast was a determinant in terms of patients wearing it or not. In this study, they found that the cast weight was significant. And so you see the third button down, the three bullet point down, I'm sorry. The TCC easy is lighter and maybe preferred treatment for patients. So I think it's funny how if you start looking at you know, across all of these articles that are written, there's a lot of common factors. So I, I just find that to be a lot of fun. Of course, um, you know, relieving pressure and getting results are two different things, but we know that pressure relief and offloading are paramount for healing. So the last study I wanted to show you is a study that's just dying to be replicated. It's almost 20 years old now, uh, but it was it was performed by Dr. Alberto Pajesi. He's uh, a form. Uh, one of the top wound care doctors in Europe. He, I think he just stepped down from being the president of the European Wound Management Association. He's in Pisa, Italy. And he did this study in 2003, looking at TCC versus crutch controlled patients with wounds. And they were looking at the wounds under a microscope. And so histopathological features were noted. And it'll be interesting. I'll share with you why he did this study in a couple minutes, but I wanna show you the results first. They took 
Oh, here's a neat picture. This is uh, Dr. Dr. Alberto Pujasi getting the Paul Brand Memorial Award at the Desert Foot Meeting. And um, this is, and I talked to him about this article when he was here in Denver for the, or here in Phoenix for that meeting. And uh, so we'll talk about that more in a second. Let me show you the results first. So I'm going to simplify this, this graph for you. On the left side of the screen, you see at the top detrimental features for healing. Things that we see with chronic wounds, right? Hyperkeratosis, fibrosis, inflammation, and cellular debris. All of these things can be seen under a microscope. All of these are noted to be present when wounds are in the chronic inflammatory stage of non-healing, if you will. Below that are beneficial features, things that we see when a patient's in the proliferative phase of wound healing, a healthy granular base, leading edges of cutaneous annex, as they call them, or the epidermal migration from the periphery, and then capillaries within the wound bed. Not surprising, if you look at the second and third columns, the crutch controlled group was significantly higher, statistically significantly higher in those variables that are detrimental to healing that we see in the inflammatory phases of wound care. The third, pair, the third column down over shows that at the bottom, the TCC group had statistically significant increases in the very things we see in the proliferative phase of wound healing, granulation tissue, leading edge of epithelial tissue, and, and capillaries within the wound bed. So this is a great study, right? This is showing that, geez, you know, if, if, we, if we debride the patients, and we let them go through those two to five days of inflammatory phase, and we get them into the proliferative phase of wound healing, if we just protect that wound, while they ambulate, while they do the activities of daily living, the stage is set for them to heal. So that's, that's one of the really neat, neat things about total contact casting. So the next slide gives you an example of that. On the left, you see a patient with a chronic wound came into my clinic. You see all the callus formation. You see it's got a relatively healthy granular, granular base. It's, it might be a little pale, but it's healthy. The picture you see in the middle is that same foot two weeks after we instituted total contact casting. And you'll see a little bit of maceration because of, obviously it's a large wound, there's lots of drainage. But if you look at that wound and you go over to the third picture, that's a blow up of that picture. You can literally see, if, if you pretend that's a clock and you look at between like three o'clock and six o'clock at the bottom, you can see that glaze. That glaze that you see is the leading edge of epithelial tissue. It is exquisitely fragile. If the patient were to walk two steps on that to go to the bathroom, that leading edge of epithelial tissue would disappear. That's why it's imperative to keep these patients offloaded. You can't let them say, oh, doc, I wore my offloading device 95 out of 100 steps, because if they do that, they, they ruin the leading edge of the migration of the epithelial tissue. So this is just a good example of that. So. I've been to Pisa multiple times and spent time, spent a lot of time with Alberto. Uh, on the bottom picture here, you see him explaining to me why he did this study. The reason he did this study in 2003 was because in Europe, if a patient had a diabetic foot ulcer, it was being recommended that they just amputate their leg. And Alberto Pajesi told them, no, if we get the pressure off these wounds, if we debride them appropriately, if we make sure there's an adequate blood supply and no infection, these patients can heal like any other patient. And then when you see the picture on the right, that was me back in 2020 before COVID hit, I was over in Italy spending time. And what Dr. Pajesi told me at that time was the goal of UMA, the European Wound Management Association, was to get all the specialties on the same page with protocols um, so that all of us do what we do best, whether you're an infectious disease doc, whether you're a vascular surgeon, whether you're a podiatrist or general surgeon, but we work together to make sure the patient gets all of the variables they need to ensure a positive outcome. And one of those variables is offloading. So just a little history here. Uh, when I developed the CAST, um, I did it with National Institutes of Health and Department of Defense funding. And I wanted to make sure that we had the attributes we discussed before, locking the ankle at 90 degrees, eliminating the propulsive phase of gait, which takes the pressure off the ball of the foot. And that's where we see 80% of wounds. We want to redistribute pressure into the leg. We want to reduce pressure from the plantar surface and thereby reduce frictional forces. If we do that, four times as many patients go into casts. Uh, we, we save the health system money. 
and the patients, most important, the patients do extremely well. So we do a lot of workshops, and this is an example of some casting workshops we did with doctors and, and nurse practitioners and physical therapists and PAs. Um, we had just had a great time. Uh, I am hoping that we get back to this someday. I think in-person webinars and workshops are really the way to go, uh, but certainly we it's nice to take advantage of technologies like Zoom. So I really appreciate all of you spending time. Um, I went through that in about 30 minutes or so. So we've got lots of time to answer questions. And uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing. And Troy, um, the best part of these is question and answer. And I, I just, I like that the most. So um, let's let's hit it. Oh, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you. That was that was fantastic. And, and uh, some of the great pictures from Pisa as well. It's making me wanna travel to Europe now, which is uh, fantastic. Uh, one of the kind of just touching on what you were mentioning there, especially about the 2003 study and, and in Europe, uh, kind of on a similar topic here. One of the questions we often get here uh, is about people who are working in a remote community. So this person, for example, saying that they work in a remote community. Do you have any strategies to encourage buy in from uh, from surgeons or or on limb preservation? Uh, they work in a remote community with uh, general and ortho surgery who often disagree over who is responsible for managing uh, D uh, DFUs or diabetic foot wounds and are often quick to jump to, to amputation versus serial debridement and wound care, including offloading. Do you have any kind of quick tips or strategies that you would probably uh, recommend? Well, you know, all politics are local, right? <laughs> As they say. Um, I have found over the years that doctors and nurses alike want the best for the patient. So I think when you have a doctor saying, it's in your best interest to have an amputation here, Oftentimes there are reasons for that, right? Significant infections or significant vascular compromise that they can't fix. Um, I, you know, I don't think a lot of these doctors are want to amputate limbs that have great vascular status and no infection, right? So, you know, we're living in this unique age of having data at our fingertips, and when you've got groups like the International Working Group on the Diabetic Foot. Uh, they're they're putting out statements that are uh, valid whether you live in the United States, Canada, or in Nigeria, right? I mean, you've got all these these thought leaders coming together, and I agree. What we deliver in some areas, you know, like I'll just use a simple example: hyperbaric oxygen. We may use utilize hyperbaric oxygen, but in a rural environment, they may not have it. Likewise, we may not have the advanced vascular assessment technologies in a rural environment that we have in a wound care center, but we still have the ability to assess the blood supply uh, through other non-invasive assessments like ABIs and whatnot. So I think that uh, education is paramount. Um, you know, I, I, I don't tell doctors how to practice, but I do share with them the best way to work up patients to make the best decisions for them. Um, so I, I think that it, education is the key um, and, and, you know, every, every situation is different, uh, but I think that, uh, you know, nobody wants to see thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of synthetic skin grafts put on a wound and then the wound's not offloaded. So they wonder why the patient's not healed in eight weeks, right? I mean, nobody wants mm -hmm. to do that either. So utilization of resources is key using um, advanced products to their best ability is so important. And if we do that, we're going to get out good outcomes. And then we have to remember, um, I think it was Jesse Thompson. He was an ortho, no, he was a vascular surgeon. He said, sometimes the best vascular procedure you can perform is a below the knee amputation. But that's not true if there's good blood supply, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I'll get off my pedestal now and I'll just say, hey, everybody has to do what's best for the patient in this certain environment. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that kind of answers, I, I know, Jolene's question that came in here was sort of uh, similar about that, about the education piece. Uh, she was mentioning that uh, uh, they have occasional issues with people who are taking the uh, TCC boot off, even with a lot of education, and occasionally the TCC was broken when they came in. Is there anything else you could potentially elaborate maybe on the strategies sure. that you find have worked best? Uh, they mentioned that they've seen doctors even tape them on. And initial uh, initially with the tape, but then unsure if that's been been effective. So, um, yeah, maybe we can just touch on that quickly. Yeah, I would love to. I'll, I'll I'll start with a story. I used to have a boot with a lock on it. It was one of those three digit locks, and you know, the patients would go home and pick the lock. You know, they started zero zero one, and they'd always they go all the way up to nine hundred and ninety nine until they figured out the lock 
combination just for fun. But it's a system, right? The cast and the outer boot work together. The cast by itself won't work because like you said, it breaks, it cracks. So I encouraged all my patients to wear the boot all the time. And if there's an issue with it being dirty outside and clean in the house, sometimes they can have two boots, the in-house boot and the outdoor boot. I get that. I had to deal with that in Denver when I was in practice. The other thing though is we use zip ties. We just put zip ties around it so they can't take it off. And we encourage the patients to use a pillowcase at night to sleep, put the, ca the cast in a pillowcase and then a pillow between their legs so that the cast doesn't create contralateral, contralateral issues on the ankle or you know, have any other issues like that. So um, that to me is the answer for that. Um, and, and it's worked well over time. Perfect. Well, thanks for touching on that. And thanks for the question, Jolena. I'm going to switch gears just slightly here. Uh, one of the questions that had come in about, uh, do you know if it's possible to modify the TCC or the application for a diabetic foot also, or sorry, diabetic foot or for char, char cut feet? Is it charco or char cut feet? Sorry about that. Charco. I should know the no, pronunciation. There we go. Yeah. Do you know if that's, if it's able to be modified for that? So when I developed the original TCC Easy, it was for patients that didn't have charcoal, but we've modified that over time. We've got the black outer boots that can accommodate for charcoal deformities plantarly. And if they're slightly medial or slightly lateral, we can modify it. However, and this is a big however, if the charcoal is so severe that the foot is laterally dislocated out from under the leg, you have to use a traditional total contact cast because that black boot is straight, right? The black boot that comes with the cast. So if you have significant deformity of the foot out from under the leg, you can't use the TCC easy. So that's a good question. Really good question. Gotcha. Uh, one of the questions here that we have in from Catherine is, uh, do you keep patients non-ambulatory post abridement then until the TTC easy is applied or until the inflammatory phase is resolved? Nope. If there's no signs of infection, we debreed the wounds thoroughly. Debridement meaning removal of all non-viable tissue, meaning those tissues that don't have a blood supply, right? It's callus, fibrotic tissue. We put them in a cast the same day. Gotcha. And if there is significant, if you need hemostasis, you can use silver nitrate sticks. I used to have battery operated cautery units in my, in my fridge in the clinic and I was bzz, 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 just get it to stop bleeding. Nothing like a good old pressure and a little alginate though. That works great too. There you go. Uh, we've got quite a few now. Now the questions are really coming in here. So we got right quite on. a few to go through. Uh, right. One of the questions here is from Eve. And I think we got it in the chat earlier on as well was uh, how long does the same boot stay on before it's changed to a new one? So the, um, the cast is what gets changed, not the boot. The cast is changed in two to three days because when the, when the cone of the leg starts assuming the body weight, you will see reduction in swelling of the lower leg. It's not from direct pressure. It's just from total contact. When there's no longer total contact, the weight isn't taken up in the leg and the weight is taken up on the foot. So that usually occurs within two to three days. So from a standard protocol, when the cast is put on the first day, you take it off in two to three days, just put a new cast on. Then you can go weekly for cast changes. But if there's a tremendous amount of exudate, like the wound I showed you in the in the presentation. If there's lots of exit, you can change the cast twice a week if you need to. Gotcha. And that kind of leads maybe into this next question. Maybe if you want to just elaborate a little bit more is, can it be used with heavily draining wounds? Is there an opening uh, to get to the wound? Uh, you know, we don't advocate windowing the cast, but we do advocate using polyurethane foams and even stacking them if necessary, as long as they don't have an offsite backing out, uh, you know, over the foam. Uh, we want foams that'll wick the exudate away. Because remember, the primary use of a dressing, primary dressing, there's three things. You want to absorb exudate, you want to prevent peri wound maceration, and you don't want to uh, traumatize the, the granulation base. To get those three things, a polyurethane foam usually works best. Fantastic. Well, thanks for covering that. Uh, switching gears a little bit here. Uh, what is your systematic workup strategy? Asks uh, someone in the chat here. Sure. Um, so I use the VIPs as the top priorities and the very top priorities are infection control and vascular status. If there's, and I say infection first because infection is most important. If there's an infection, we need to clear the infection. If it's a, you know, if you use your, your international working group definitions, uh, if it's a soft tissue 
infection that doesn't extend to deeper tissues and only has like half a centimeter of erythema, you can put that patient on oral antibiotics. But if there's a, if it's a deep infection, if it's, if the wound's probing to, right, you know, you put a probe and it goes all the way up the foot because pus it's wor is working its way up the flexor tendons, that patient needs to go to the OR and clear the infection. While you're doing that, you're assessing for the vascular status also, because once you clear the infection, the only way that we're going to deliver antibiotics to that wound is through the bloodstream. So you clear the infection, you make sure the blood flow is there, and then you got to prepare that patient for outpatient visits. Sometimes you can do a delayed primary closure. Sometimes you want to use a vac. The key thing is to get the wound filled into the point where you can get them back on a cast so they can ambulate. The, the main thing is ambulation. You want them to walk and heal at the same time. So I have seen casts windowed. The challenge with windowing a cast is that the soft tissue will herniate through that little window and you'll end up with an edge effect. Mm -hmm. So um, that can be a challenge. You're best off using, um, you know, utilizing different dressings that can be absorptive. Gotcha, perfect. Okay, now we got a couple more questions that have been coming in here. Uh, Kathleen is asking here, you spoke about adapting a boot or a, for the shape of a foot if needed. How easy is this to do? They're in a rural community with limited resources. And they're also just asking on top of that, whether it could be used for non-planter surface wounds. I missed the beginning of your question on the first question. Uh, the first question was about uh, how easy is it or is the technique to, to adapt the boot to shape uh, for, for certain feet? Cool. Is, how, is this an easy, easy task? Yeah. Is this someone who probably hasn't done it before? So, so the answer to you is yes, it is easy. And the reason why is if you were to look at the cast materials, they have these little honeycombs. So the cast, as you roll it on the leg, the cast will open up exactly to the size of the leg. Mm. So when you roll it on, of course, the ankle's narrower, right? So those little honeycombs don't open up as much. But as you roll the cast up the leg, it opens up to the exact size of the leg. So it's a smart cast in a way, if you think about it that way, that it does conform to the leg as it is. It does not provide compression though. It only, it only takes up pressure. So it, it's not hard to get to conform to the leg. It really works out well. And it, it, it takes a few applications to get used to it. I, I'll be, you know, nobody's great at something the first time. I mean, I always tell my docs, I'm like, you know, you didn't wake up one day and walk into the OR and fix an ankle fracture. You were trained. You did a few of them. You got the hang of it. You use good surgical technique and you use great fixation technique. Same thing with wound care, whether you're putting on casts or debriding wounds, right? Amazing. I think it's a great way of answering it. Uh, uh, one person was also just asking here, uh, how long would you recommend that the T TCC Easy Cast stay on after a wound heals? So I used to have a protocol in my clinic. I would keep the patient in, a, in the cast one week after healing, as long as I had a shoe and appropriate insult to transition them into. You know, technically, to get the epithelial tissue to have tensile strength to withstand a shoe, it's usually two weeks. Um, but I found that if you keep them in the cast for an extra week and then you transition them into the shoe and appropriate insole, they did just fine. If you put the patient into a shoe immediately upon healing, um, you're asking for that wound to open up again. Because, you know, oftentimes, you know, when you first see the healed wound, you can almost see the pink granulation tissue through the skin. So that needs to increase its depth. I've got a really cool picture, but I didn't put it in this slide um, showing uh, migration of skin from the periphery and how it also gets thicker at the same time from the periphery towards the center. It's just levels of cells thick, really. Gotcha. And uh, one person was just asking as well, uh, whether it's uh, there's a link to your protocol for the TCC that is uh, shareable, or was it in one of your slides? I didn't see if it was, I can't remember if it was there or not. The length? Uh, the link link or a, a way to access the protocol for, for TCC. I can't remember if that was something that you included in the slides oh, it, or yeah, not. It's in the instructions for use. It's within the cast. Okay, yeah. gotcha. In fact, if you go online and you 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 look, you look just search TCC EZ, you'll see the instructions for use online and all of all of the warnings, the indications, the contraindications, the dressing, the cast changes, all of those are defined in the instructions for use. Fantastic, okay, that's perfect. Uh, so Eve is also just asking here, um, who typically applies the cast? Uh, do, is it typically community nurses that you see or RNs, uh, practical nurses, uh, could they change in, in the home care setting? What do you typically see or what, what do you know about, uh, typically for who's applying it? 
it's all over the board. I see physical therapy clinics and the physical therapists are applying it. I see nurse run clinics and the nurses are applying it. I see managed care clinics where the docs are in the, at least in the vicinity because they're billing for it, right? Um, I see, I see I, my, in my clinic, my podorthist who fitted the shoes and insoles also did a lot of the casting. So um, the, the, how do I say this? You know, you don't really get paid for putting on the cast. You get paid for the workup that tells you that the patient's a candidate for a cast and, and that they would need a cast. That's the brain power of the process. Actually applying the cast is, is no problem. I mean, anybody can do it after a couple applications. Perfect. That I see, yeah, that, that's, that's perfect. And Michelle, I'm just seeing some people sharing some comments in the chat here. Michelle's mentioned in Alberta, they've done it in a clinic setting uh, and just needed access to warm water as per the instructions. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Michelle. And I see Denise, you're looking to do some more research there. Um, just to see if there's any other big comments here I can share with the rest of the group here. Uh, Denise talked about, yeah, it's something they want to try, try to get to cover for First Nations people and talk to primary care nurses. Jolene was saying, uh, going back to one of our earlier questions, that they had someone who actually cut their cast off with a saw from their workshop. Unfortunately, mm. didn't cut themselves. But yeah, mm. some create some pretty crazy stories that we're hearing uh, coming in here. Troy, um, can I make a comment on that? Yeah, I go for it. Super, super important for everybody, if you have not used a cast saw, to realize that cast saws oscillate. They don't spin. They oscillate. So it, I've had a patient, only one out of all the thousands of casts I applied that took his cast off in his, in his, in his garage using a bandsaw. They're lucky they don't cut their whole foot off, right? Because they just whoosh, cut right through. The, the, the cast saw and its oscillating motion, there's no way you can cut a patient because if you're over the felt, which is a quarter inch thick, you're not going to cut the patient. I don't, I don't think I ever cut a patient. I took 15,000 of them off, you know? Uh, and I think uh, Jolene was mentioning a little bit earlier too, that they were working at an HBO and wound clinic where the compressors were downstairs in the parking garage. I'd be doing startup, see their patients pull in, they get out of their car, dig it out, they dig out their offloading boot from the trunk, put it in on the garage and then tell the clinic that they, they never took it off. So yeah. Yeah. I've got, pictures uh, of a, I've got pictures from a clinic in Britain in London area where as the patient left the clinic going to his car, he had both of his crutches over his shoulder. Just walking mm. around because it doesn't hurt, right? Yeah, no pain. Pain is our trained way to recognize danger. And when patients don't feel pain, they don't recognize that it's problematic. And they don't realize that a small wound on the foot can lose a leg. Whereas, you know, if they go to the ER and they're treated for an ankle fracture, they'll wear a cast on the right leg, even if they have to, they can't drive. They're like, I get it. It hurts like crazy, but I feel better when I'm in a cast. They need to associate the the long-term ramifications and the sequelae of having a wound get infected to appreciate how serious the wound is. And that's that educational component we talked about, Troy. Yeah, absolutely. All righty, I'm going to get to a couple more questions here. One of them is from Deborah, who asks, uh, do you know um, offhand what the rate of wound recurrence is once TCC is stopped? It depends on your, your, pat, your protocol afterwards. Uh, Mike Edmonds did some great work on this. If you put the patient into appropriate shoes and insoles, the recurrence rate over two years is going to hover around 30%. Recurrence meaning same foot, same location. If you put them back in the shoes that created the wound to start with, your two-year amputation or two-year recurrence rate is going to hover around 95%. Gotcha. And then, thank, and thank then of course, Troy, there's also surgical offloading, right? Um, click case in point. Halix IPJ ulcer. If you do a Keller procedure and take out the base of the proximal phalanx, you'll have a fibrous union at the joint. All of a sudden, the hallux can dorsiflex and you'll never have a wound there again. So you can surgically correct deformities also. Fantastic. And another question I have here is I think it's a kind of a common theme uh, for some of our questions is about, could you maybe just even walk us through a little bit how you would be, you know, how you would approach a patient who might be hesitant uh, or have a resistance to being offload initially? Uh, I yep. think that was some of the questions that are coming up yeah. about that hesitancy or uh, kind of thing. So remember my second slide said leaders do the right thing and managers do things right. You got to put your leader hat on when the patient's in front of you. And you can even take a piece of paper out and write at the top, infection, no infection. Blood supply, great blood supply. Debreedment, I debreeded it. And then you get to offloading and you tell the patient, 
we need to get the pressure off this wound. And I want to do it in a way that will enable you to continue to walk and ambulate and do activities of daily living. Here's the statistics. The statistics are very straightforward. If you wear this cast, 90% of the time, you're healed in three to, three to five weeks. If you don't wear this cast, there's a 50% chance you're going to get infected and be in the hospital and a 20% chance you're going to lose part of your foot or your entire leg. I'm the doctor. I'm telling you, you need to be in this cast. If you wear the cast for four to six weeks, you'll be wearing appropriate shoes and insoles and you'll be driving and doing all the things you love to do. So you don't even, and then at that point, they're like, well, yeah, this is a no brainer, right? It's yeah, education, absolutely. education, yeah. education. And, and here's the other thing, Troy, you can't have your nurses or doctors going into a room and saying, you know, we could put you into a cast, but that makes it harder to drive and makes it harder to bathe. Do you want a cast? What do you think the patient's gonna say? Mm -hmm. No, I don't want to cast, right? But if you go in there and you tell them, we need to heal you so you don't get infected and lose a limb, and this is our healing rates here at this clinic, you're here to, for our help to heal this wound. If you don't want to heal, I mean, I'm not going to make, you can't make people do things. They got to be on the same team as you, you know? These are some yeah. of my favorite topics, Troy, because I dealt with it for decades, right? In, the, as, in my clinic, my wound care center. Absolutely. Well, I like that you're bringing them into, yeah, you're being responsible for their care as well, right? Bringing them onto that team. I think that's a fantastic oh. message to be sharing there. And I think, yeah, when you bring up the stats, it's hard to, it's hard to negotiate with stats, right? So there you go. Uh, well, I think that's fantastic. The other thing I used to tell them, I said, you know, if you leave your foot here, we'll heal it and you pick it up some other day. <laughs> you can do that. And that usually breaks the ice. You know, it's not quite as serious, but um, I mean, essentially that's true. I mean, you know, if they're, they're in a, their compliance or adherence is a is really part of your practice right it's no different than if you have high blood pressure and you're taking medications to control your blood pressure if the patient walks out and takes the bottle of pills and throws them in the garbage they can't blame you for it i mean mm -hmm. you know they're not doing what they need to do absolutely well kind of uh i'm just seeing there's a couple um thematic questions that are coming up here and it's regarding uh plastic coverings or way of, of keeping it dry so someone was mentioning about so when it gets inclement or wet weather uh what do we do if there's a best way to keep it while you're trying to shower um, any suggestions there about keeping the the tcc dry absolutely there's cast bags uh available online um, cast protectors, protection bags. And then what you do is uh, you put the that on over the cast and you put that with the cast inside the black boot if you're going out. Um, same with showering. I mean, you can wear those cast protectors. Um, Brown Medical, I, I think it was Brown Medical probably made the best one that never broke when we had our patients putting it on. But there's lots of different ones and there's lots of advancements in, the, in that area. So, um, you know, what you don't want to do is have the patient put a trash bag around their cast and try mm -hmm. to tie, it, put a put a zip tie or something around it so that that um, all it does is delay how quickly the cast gets wet. Right, we've seen that. Perfect. A uh, couple other questions here. One is about: uh, Is there a TCC for bariatric patients that you know of? Yeah. Well, what you the best thing you can do is use a, tr a traditional total contact cast. Um, it's hard. It's very hard. But here's the thing about bariatric type patients. They're not as active. So if you do get them in a device, they're not as prone to take it off either. Um, mm. But I've had patients I've had to use compression bandages on. Um, I've had patients that have needed two rolls of plaster and six rolls of fiberglass, right, to be strong enough to let them walk. Tough, tough, tough patient population for sure. And uh, another question here, a couple of people were asking, uh, just if you could go over again, the uh, difference between regular or traditional TCC versus the T TCC easy and whether there are other different uh, contraindications or uh, different populations or, or, or anyone that would be contraindicated for. Sure. So a traditional total contact cast, because you're using plaster and you're rolling in fiberglass, you can, you can make a cast out of any leg, any deformity. Um, and then you can enable that cast to be walked upon. With the TCC EZ, 90% or more of the patients that you treat can use the TCC EZ. You just can't put a patient in a TCC EZ who has a significant deformity. Um, usually that deformity is in the transverse plane. So if the foot is laterally deviated out from underneath the tibia, you can't use a TCC EZ. If your Charcot prominence 
is plantar, right? It's in the sagittal plane. We have a, a Charcot boot that works great. It's got a tri-density foam that when you wear that boot with a cast in it, the, even the cast doesn't bottom out. It's really, it's really good technology, solid technology. Perfect. And I'm just trying to say, I want to make sure I'm not missing anything here. Uh, let's go to this one here. So Michelle, and I think this would be recommending a couple questions ago here, but you're recommending, uh, sorry, you, you would recommend for orthotics or custom shoes to remain in the TCC until the shoe or orthotic arrives? Or does this mean, this would mean that they have to go for their fitting and then back to the TCC, which can take some time and then the long run might benefit and healing that ways the outcome. Uh, could you maybe just touch on the orthotics again, sure. or a component? So at some point during this healing process, you're going to need to get an impression of the patient's foot. Um, and then you're going to need a, your podorthist, whoever's making your insoles, and to get that ready. So you're right. It happens during the treatment of the patient. And if your clinic steps them in the phone boxes or a podorthist comes to your clinic and gets the outline of the foot and an impression of the foot, then they can make the device and get the shoe ready so that once they're healed, they can transition into that shoe. Um, it takes some coordination of the healthcare providers. And that was one of the reasons in my wound care center, I had a podorthist either on staff for 17 years, or if I was going between podorthists, I had an agreement with a local prosthetic um, a podorthic group that would come in and actually fit our patients. Gotcha. Purple. Thank you for touching on that. And it looks like we have another question here from Jolene. Uh, how long would you wait post application before they go into the hyperbaric uh, chamber uh, yep. or hyperbaric oxygen therapy chamber? Yep. So um, this is the protocol that the wound care centers use in the States. Patient will come in, they will have the cast taken off because you can't put a dirty cast of things into hyperbarics. You take off the cast, you debride the wound, you put a bandage on the foot, you send them to hyperbarics, they undergo hyperbaric oxygen care, then they come back over and have the cast applied. The alternative to that is to put the cast on, wait at least eight hours. I mean, it, at one point it was 24, then it went to 12, and now it's eight for safety um, because there's exothermic reactions off the cast, right? So if you put the cast on in the afternoon, they can come in the next day and go right into the, wearing the cast, they can go into the hyperbaric oxygen unit. Um, and I realized they go into hyperbarics three or four times a week and they only have their cast changed once a week. Just gotta be careful for dirty casts and things. Perfect. And uh, this person is going back again to her question about what you can kind of put underneath the TCC there. One person is asking about dressings that might be used uh, to help with swelling and exit, or sorry, with uh, exudative absorption that might swell are there any dressings that you know of that would not work uh, under the TCC? Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. yeah, you don't want, you do not want to use any occlusive dressings. Hydrocolloids like duoderm don't work with casting. Um, even a, even a poly, polyurethane foam like a leave-in that has an opsite backing will create a macerated foot in that area. You need to wear, you, you know, um, you, you need to use dressings that are, are that can have an, a, absorptive capabilities but not an occlusive backing on them. Gotcha. And it looks like we just have a couple more questions, which is perfect because we're almost coming up to our time there. Uh, sure. Tracy also was just asking about, so they use TCC in their clinic and have some, have had some issues with the cast collapsing either on the lateral edge or at the ankle bend. Do you have any tips for how you kind of avoid this or manage that? Yep. Uh, that only happens in two situations. If the cast was applied in a, with, in a plantar flexed position, so that when the patient stands up on it, it collapses at the ankle, or if the patient's not wearing the black outer boot. Because once you get the cast on, if the foot's at 90 degrees, if they always wear that boot, you will not see a collapse of the cast. Fantastic. Uh, and our last question is, is the TCCEZ available in Canada? Yes, indeed. And it is. <laughs> indeed. Fantastic. And I think that comes to the uh, end of our questions here. I just want to echo everyone saying here, great webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very informable. Uh, best webinar ever. Or no, that was just me saying that. <laughs> best webinar ever. Uh, so I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Jensen, and, and of course, Integra for helping uh, make this educational webinar possible today. Uh, and thank everybody from across Canada and even internationally for joining us today. Uh, there's over, where is the number here? Over 140 of you 
uh, on with us today, which is fantastic to see. So it just goes to show how in, uh, engaging and interesting the subject was. So thank you, Dr. Jensen, for bringing this to us. Oh, you're welcome, Troy. Thanks for having me. And uh, anything we can do, um, the folks at Integra in Canada are fabulous. And uh, Leslie's on the line. Um, and then, you know, sometime, and I've given lectures up in Canada, maybe we get together and do a ca total contact cast workshop. There you go. Not before we uh, go fishing together first, though. So I hope you enjoy your fishing trip up in Ontario here and uh, sure. enjoy the rest of your trip there. All right. Well, All right. thank you, everybody. And we will uh, see you at our next webinar. Have a great evening. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for coming.